Unit 1, Agricultural Inputs. What are agricultural inputs? Well, agricultural inputs include anything added to uh, a crop, an animal, whatever, um, in order to produce that crop. That includes things such as fertilizers, pesticides, irrigation, soil amendments, uh, erosion preventatives such as mulch, animal feed, um, depending on the crops being grown, pollination services can be agricultural inputs as well. For instance, in the uh, almond groves in California, um, there are virtually no natural pollinators. It's a huge area of thousands of acres of monocrops, and the uh, almond trees bloom for two weeks in February. So essentially, all of the pollination has to be done by uh, bees, which are trucked in, um, quite literally millions of beehives trucked to California every year for pollinating almonds. And then as soon as the almonds are done, they're hauled away. Um, we'll look at each of these types of inputs in more detail uh, in the upcoming slides. First, let's talk about traditional agricultural inputs. And for the purposes of this unit, we're defining traditional agriculture as the type of large-scale agriculture as practiced in developed countries, particularly the United States and Europe. Um, by this definition, though, traditional agriculture is a relatively new thing, uh, emerging primarily after World War II. And with the introduction of new and inexpensive and effective pesticides and fertilizers. Um, and the manufacture of chemical fertilizers accelerated greatly at that time. Agricultural inputs, um, including fertilizers, pesticides, and animal feeds, uh, are often regulated on both the state uh, and federal levels. Um, other inputs such as antibiotics and hormone treatments for some animals are also regulated. Um, on the federal level, pesticides are generally regulated by the EPA, while animal feeds, hormones, antibiotics, and that sort of thing are generally regulated by the USDA. In addition, most states have regulations on which plants and animals can be brought into the state and how they may be used in agriculture. Uh, these regulations are meant to control the spread of disease and insects, such as gypsy moth, emerald ash borers, various plant diseases, such as thousand canker disease, uh, citrus canker, sudden oak death, soybean rust, that sort of thing. So now we'll look at the types of individual inputs. Um, first, we have fertilizers. And fertilizers generally fall into two main categories. Traditional chemical or inorganic fertilizers, often derived from uh, petroleum. And natural, so-called natural fertilizers, such as compost and manure. Pesticides are also divided into categories, and this one, three broad categories. And in addition to that, each category can be further subdivided. Um, the three main categories are insecticides, which are used to control insects and other animal pests, such as harmful nematodes and mites. Herbicides, which are used to control unwanted plants, which we generally refer to as weeds. And disease control. And for plants, disease control consists primarily of fungicides. Um, we don't have any uh, uh, quality, effective uh, antibiotics um, for bacterial diseases or antivirals um, that we use much on plants. So it's primarily fungicides. Um, each of those categories can be subdivided into chemical or inorganic or natural or organic. 
And yes, there are pesticides approved for use on organic crops. There is an additional group of pest control items, uh, sometimes included in the natural or organic group, but often separated into its own category. And that's the uh, biological control or biocontrol uh, group of pesticides. This includes things like the use of beneficial insects and other organisms to control pests, um, primarily insects, including things like using ladybugs, laced wings, praying mantises, that sort of thing as uh, control for harmful insects, or the use of beneficial microbes, such as milky spore, to control grubs, or the use of Bacillus thuringiensis, uh, another bacteria, um, to control larval insects, um, basically caterpillars, any type of caterpillar, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis is used for control. Um, also includes using plants, such as marigold, sage, petunia, or chives, to repel insects and mammals such as deer, rabbits, and mice. Um, the use of biological products such as insect pheromones to control insects also falls into this group. Uh, for instance, uh, you may see traps um, looking like small cardboard milk cartons and that sort of thing uh, stapled to uh, trees. And these traps contain uh, things like gypsy moth pheromone that attracts the males uh, to think they're going to mate and they get trapped inside the, uh, the containers. Biocontrols have been used for decades, if not centuries, but new emphasis has been placed on natural methods of control, so there's renewed interest in the various types of biocontrols. Irrigation. Irrigation is simply adding water to crops when the natural moisture levels are too low for the crop that's being grown. Depending on the irrigation system being used and the crop being grown, Water used for irrigation can sometimes be used as a carrier um, for fertilizers or pesticides. So the fertilizers and the pesticides are injected into the uh, water irrigation stream and are uh, introduced to the plants that way. Soil amendments. Soil amendments are things, pretty much anything that's added to the soil to improve its structure and fertility. Soil structure determines how well the soil does things like retain water and nutrients, how easily air penetrates, and how well plant roots can move through the soil. Structure is one of the most important items determining the productivity of a soil. And soil amendments include things like compost, uh, things called green manure, which are actually not manures at all, but uh, cover crops like annual rye, um, which are planted after the uh, main crops are harvested. Uh, they sprout up. They actually help hold soil uh, and prevent erosion as well. Um, but before the main crop is planted the next season, uh, these green manure crops are uh, tilled into the soil and uh, they add organic matter and help build soil structure. They add a degree of fertility. And as I mentioned, they help um, control erosion. Um, crop residue. So uh, after harvesting a uh, soybean field or a corn field or a wheat field, um, the remains of the previous crop are left in place. Uh, that helps as, a, uh, as they break down, it helps build soil structure and again also helps with erosion. Um, animal waste or manure uh, is often added. Um, both as a soil amendment and as a fertilizer. <clears throat> erosion preventatives include anything used to control soil erosion. 
um, through the action of either water or wind. In large-scale farming, most erosion control is accomplished through contour plowing, following the natural contours of the land um, to help slow down runoff. Uh, things called grassed swales, you may notice in uh, large fields, uh, strips of uh, grass growing in the field with uh, corn, soybeans, or other large-scale crops on either side. Um, retaining crop residue, that's, that is not removing or instantly plowing under um, the residue from the previous crop. Or, as mentioned before, uh, using cover crops, such as annual rye. Um, not mentioned before uh, were things such as wind breaks, where rows of trees or shrubs are planted um, at the edges of fields that helps control, uh, reduce the action of wind uh, in removing the soil. Large-scale farming generally covers areas too large to be economically mulched, through, though crop residue and cover crops can perform uh, much the same function. Finally, uh, animal feed. Depending on the animal, uh, what they're fed may be produced completely on site, such as uh, with cattle. It's fairly common with cattle, where they graze in the fields in the spring, summer, and fall. Um, on the farm there and during winter are fed on hay and corn that were grown and harvested on the farm. Um, however, some animal feeds um, are mass produced, um, especially those for poultry, uh, and are brought in from the outside. So that, that concludes section one.